Now in our study, in our last study, we began the section in John's Gospel where Jesus is ministering exclusively to His apostles as His death is imminent. And we studied the events that took place as the Lord shared the final Passover meal with them. Not going to go over that, just giving you a little review. And we saw that although the, uh, the Lord's Supper is not mentioned in John, um, John does provide a lot of information about what took place that night. So in the other Gospels you get information about the Lord's Supper, but in John he doesn't mention the Lord's Supper itself, but he does talk about uh, all the intimate things that took place between himself and his uh, apostles that night. One major event was the unmasking of Judas as the traitor, which set into motion the sequence, of event, the sequence of events that ultimately led to Jesus' arrest, and of course we know that. Now with the few remaining hours left before His suffering was to begin, Jesus focuses on providing His apostles with the teaching and the encouragement that they're going to need in order to make it through the next couple of days. I think about it now. You know, we read this and we read the Bible, you know, but try to read it as something that's happening to human beings. You know, Jesus knows He's going to suffer a terrible, terrible suffering and a violent death, and that's just coming in, a, in, in the matter of hours. And His apostles, they don't have a clue of what's coming. And so if you read John, especially this section, with the idea that he's getting them ready for a very bad thing that's going to happen, that he knows is going to happen, okay? So what we have is Jesus' final teachings and encouragement that John records. Now we have other teachings and words of encouragement from the Lord after His resurrection, and even after His ascension into heaven, you know, He speaks to Paul, for example, in Acts chapter 18, 9 and 10. But this section in John's Gospel is the last full and lengthy teaching that he provides. Uh, also, this body of teaching and exhortation will go on for several chapters and is only interrupted occasionally by questions from his apostles based on what Jesus is saying. So the section that we're going to cover today includes the teaching of Jesus and the questions of four of the apostles and the response of the Lord to their questions. Remember I said the book of John, if you look at it as a piece of literature, um, is, is basically a series of dialogues. Jesus is talking to the crowds, Jesus is talking to the, uh, the priests, Jesus is talking to the Pharisees, and they're talking to Him. You know, we just go from one dialogue to another. So we continue this kind of uh, style, if you wish, now that he's with the apostles, now it's a dialogue between himself and the uh, apostles. So we begin with the first dialogue in this section, and that's between Jesus and Peter. Chapter 13, beginning in verse 31, let's read together. It says, therefore, when he had gone out, Jesus said, now, uh, by the way, when it says, when he has gone out, meaning Judas, Judas is gone. Okay. It says that Jesus said, now is the Son of Man glorified and God is glorified in Him. If God is glorified in Him, God will also glorify Him in Himself and will glorify Him immediately. Little children, I am with you a little while longer. You will seek Me, and as I said to the Jews, now I also say to you, where I am going, you cannot come. So with the departure of Judas, Jesus knew that the cycle of events that would eventually bring Him to the cross is now going to begin. He places His suffering and death in the same category, believe it or not, as His miracles. He places His suffering and death in the same category as His prophecies and His teachings and His resurrection and His uh, uh, ascension. All of these things, he says, will glorify Him. When he says glorify Him, he means will point to Him as the Son of God. That's what he's talking about. And so Jesus declares that even the cross is a source of glory 
to Him, will point to Him and give Him honor and glory. Now we know now that this is true because the cross provides redemption and salvation for all men, a, a, a truly glorious thing, but back then they didn't understand that idea. For them, you know, dying on a cross was the same thing as being hung today or going to the electric chair or you know, it meant being executed and only criminals were executed. So the apostles were not sure that this was some sort of glorious thing. So Jesus is telling them in advance, this is going to glorify, you might not think of it now and you might not see it right away, but this thing that's going to happen is actually going to glorify me. So it's important for him to say this because there's going to be a temptation to view His cross as an object of shame and defeat. And Jesus is telling them ahead of time, don't think in those terms. Now, of course, the cross was God's plan. We know that. The Father sent the Son to the cross, and the fact that the Son is ready to go will glorify or honor and reveal the Father and His plan and His sacrifice to save man. In other words, don't look at the cross from man's perspective. Look at the cross from God's perspective. And if you look at it like that, you see something glorious. And so both the Father and the Son will be glorified. They will not be dishonored by this, as some Jews might think. Remember, the Jews thought, and you know, a, 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 a cursed is the one who is hung on a tree. Right? In the law, uh, Deuteronomy 21, 22 and 23, so for them, you know, it's, he's saying, the Jews are going to see this as a defeat, as something dishonorable. Don't you think in those terms about what's going to happen to me? So he prepares them on how to view what will soon, when he says immediately, he means soon, uh, uh, take place. He also reminds them that this is uh, one place where, they, where even they will not be able to follow him. When he says, where I'm going, you can't come, He's saying, I'm going to the cross. You, you, you can't come there. That's a place you can't come. It's only I can go there. He's not saying you won't be martyrs one day or you, you won't be asked to give up your lives one day, but this particular thing, this cross, you can't, you can't go there. Okay? So let's keep reading verse 34 and 35. A new commandment I give you, that you love one another even as I have uh, uh, loved you, that you also love one another. By this all men will know that you are my disciples. In the way, or in this version it says, if you have love for one another. So the commandment to love, that's nothing new. But the reason and the manner, this is something new. They're to love each other because of their faith in Jesus. You know, if I just base my ability to love somebody on my ability, there's a lot of people that I'm not going to love. And there are plenty of people I'm not even going to try to love. There are even a couple in this room. But anyways, <laughs> I couldn't resist. I couldn't. We'll edit that out, okay? <laughs> uh, but because of my faith in Christ, I'm going to make the effort. I think we can, we can relate to that as Christians. He also says they're to love each other in the way that He loved them. We have an example of how to love. And Christ, of course, gives us that example. The cross is the example. You know, anytime you're inconvenienced by making an effort to love a brother or a sister, tell yourself, well, the cross was pretty inconvenient, and that'll get everything into the right perspective. And then, of course, they're to use their love for one another in the name of Christ as a witness for their faith. You know, we like to say we're distinctive, the churches of Christ are distinctive, you know, and they are in many ways. But we have to make sure that the distinction that really counts is the way we love each other. If, that, if that's what makes us distinct among churches, then that's a good thing, okay? Because that's what Jesus said our distinction ought to be. Without, without, you know, without ignoring the rest of the things that we do, of course, the way we worship and the way we approach the scriptures and so on and so forth, uh, that's pretty unique. But the real distinction is the way that we love each other. That should be the distinction. That's the one that counts anyways. So for the Jews, their religious system and rituals, that's what separated them from other peoples. For Christians, Jesus said, it'll be their love for one another, not their worship style or the religious systems that will distinguish them from other people. Important lesson that we have to remember. And Jesus laying down His life on the cross for His disciples, that'll be the standard for that love. That's the standard. 
And so in verse 36, Peter said to him, Lord, where are you going? Jesus answered, where I go, you cannot follow me now, but you will follow later. So Peter is curious about Jesus' destination. He's thinking perhaps it's to be a place. Maybe he's going out of the country to preach elsewhere, maybe to the Jewish diaspora. You know, Jews were spread all over the world. Maybe he's going, he's going to other nations to preach to the Jews in other countries. And Jesus, of course, simply repeats his previous statement in reference to the cross. And he adds that they will also follow his way to suffering, but later on, referring to their own martyrdom because of the gospel. Verse 37, Peter said to him, Lord, why can I not follow you right now? I will lay down my life for you. And Jesus answered, will you lay down your life for me? Truly, truly, I say to you, a rooster will not crow until you deny me three times. So, you know, Peter suspects that some kind of danger might lay ahead in the future ministry with the Lord. After all, they've been threatened with death by the Jewish leaders already. They're already you know, kind of uh, being threatened all the time. And he makes a rash statement. He wants to continue the momentum of Jesus. You know, he's, he's entered the city, the triumphant entry. People are excited about him. He wants to keep that momentum going. And he says, boy, I'm ready to die with you. Let's do it. You know, let's, Let's go out in a blaze of glory. And Jesus, knowing the immediacy of his death, see Peter's thinking way ahead. You know. Jesus, in a couple of hours this is going to happen. He knows Peter's not ready to die in a couple of hours. He will be one day. We know Peter you know, died as a martyr in Rome. But he's not, ready. he's not ready now. And knowing how not ready Peter is to face this, he declares how Peter will react when faced with the real possibility of torture and death. You know, we sometimes fault Peter for his you know, rash behavior, but we sometimes do the same thing when we think we're spiritually strong uh, and then we cave in, you know, just a little temptation, or we find excuses when called upon to give help, or to do something in the Lord's church. You know, so let's not be too hard on, on Peter. Okay? And so ends uh, the first dialogue between Peter and the Lord. Remember I said four dialogues, so Peter and Jesus. Next dialogue, Jesus and Thomas, beginning in chapter 14. Jesus continues, do not let your heart be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house there are many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you, for I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And you know the way where I am going. So the evening has become quite depressing. Let's face it, we, we just called out the traitor and we're suggesting that you know, all of this is coming to an end uh, badly. Peter has been told that he's going to deny the Lord that very night. The Lord is talking about leaving them. Not a happy moment. So Jesus, you know, he shifts gears here and he gives them words of encouragement. He sees their troubled hearts and he tells them, you know, don't be down, don't be, don't be discouraged. He points them to the future that he's preparing for them in heaven. Now the figurative language of dwellings and house are used to comfort the apostles with the notion that there is a place in heaven for each of them, regardless of their talents, regardless of their disposition, regardless of their strength, regardless of their wealth. Remember, these are Jews in a, in a society where you know, the people on the top were really far up on the top and the people at the bottom, there were a lot of them at the bottom. And so Jesus is reassuring them that you guys are on the bottom and not only that, you're being rejected by your own people because you're my disciples. So he's reassuring them that, but that's okay, there's going to be a special place for you. Okay? He assures them that He Himself will guarantee their entry into, into the kingdom. Verse five, so Thomas, here's that dialogue, said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How do we know the way? So Thomas acknowledges that they still don't grasp what he's talking about uh, when he talks about his death and resurrection, his ascension into heaven. You know, if we don't know where you're going, Lord, he says, how can we know the way to get there? Jesus answers, said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father 
but through me. And when he says to the Father, he's talking, remember he's talking about heaven. And he says, I'm going to prepare a place for you in heaven. And so they say, well, we don't know how to, you know, we know how to get there. And he says, me, you, you come through me. If you want to go to the Father slash to heaven, it's through me, I'm the way. And of course he answers in a beautiful and a perfectly concise manner. The way to heaven is himself. The destination in heaven is himself. The experience or the life of heaven is himself. So we see in this dialogue a challenge once again by Jesus to his disciples to believe based on his prophecy and teaching. Remember the prophecy, he says, you're going to be in heaven with me. That's a prophecy. That's talking about the future. And the idea is, if everything I've told you in the past happens, then what I'm talking to you about the future now, well, just look at what happened in the past when I told you what was going to happen. Well, you know, that should be a source of encouragement. Not that night, mind you. Might not be a great encouragement for that night, but in the following dark days when they begin to think, you know, um, what did he say before he left? He said we'd be with him eventually. That's what's going to hold them. All right, that's second dialogue. Third dialogue is with Philip in chapter 14, beginning in verse seven. Jesus continues, if you had known me, you would have known my father also. For from now on you know him and have seen him. Uh, in verse seven. So Jesus continues the thought uh, brought on by Thomas's question and he expands on it. This is the same debate over the exact wording of this, now there is some debate, excuse me, over the exact wording of this particular, uh, this particular verse. Some scholars argue that it should read, in the way you've known me, you will know the Father. Other scholars uh, claim that it should read as it reads in the New American Standard Version uh, when we say, if you would have known me, you would have known my Father. The difference is that one is a promise and the other is a rebuke. Okay? So there's debate about how this should read. Either way, however, Jesus finishes the verse by saying that whatever happened before, they now can look forward to knowing the Father because they have seen Him in the flesh. You want to know the Father, He says, look at me. You want to get to the Father, He says, look at me. You, know, you want to know what life is like with the Father? See what life is like with me. He brings the two together. And this, of course, is another declaration by Jesus concerning His divine nature. See the cycle going round and round again? He declares His divinity with prophecy, with teaching, with miracles. Even at the very last, He's giving them prophecy, telling them what's coming into the future. So that in the future, when they see these things take place, it'll give them strength and courage. And so Philip, Philip's response, he only gets it in part. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father and it is enough for us. He thinks Jesus can show them a sign, a vision of the Father, you know, like the burning bush that Moses saw. Philip thinks that if Jesus can do this, it'll be the sign that will confirm all that He has said. And he says, and then we'll be satisfied. And so Jesus says, verse nine, beginning in verse nine, he says, Jesus said to him, have I been so long with you and yet you have not come to know me, Philip? He who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am, the, I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words that I say to you, I do not speak on my own initiative, but the Father abiding in me does His works. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father is in me. Otherwise, believe because of the works themselves. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also, and greater works than these he will do, because I go to the Father. Whatever you ask in my name, that I will do, so that my Father, excuse me, so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. So Jesus' initial question in response to Philip shows how pained he is by his lack of understanding. Don't you see, doesn't it come out through? He says, oh, 
He said, you, you're going to ask me that question? You know what, the, the, the thing that I get in my mind, you know, I, I, I taught school before, you know, a long time ago, when, anyways, in the last century. <laughs> and any of you who have been school teachers, you know, you go through the quarter or whatever, you know, the, the period of time, whether you're teaching math or English, whatever, and you've got the exercise and you've got the drills that you give the kids and you do the thing and you, you, know, you wear yourself out for three weeks you know, to get through a certain concept or something. And then some kid raises his hand and says, now what? Now which one is the verb again? And you go, oh my, you know, thank you. And you say to them, have you not been paying attention? Where were you when I, so this is exactly, if you want to, if you want to tap into the, the angst there, Jesus is saying, Philip, uh, uh, Philip, you're asking me that? I mean, you've seen it. Hey, weren't you there when Lazarus came out of the tomb? <laughs> so, you know, I, I, I don't know what it's like to be God, but I know what it's like to be human. And so that's why I really tap into those verses you know, that, that show Jesus' humanity. There you see Jesus' humanity, this exasperation. Oh man, you still don't get it. So, you know, he wants further convincing for his lack of understanding. So Jesus says to him, and let's break this down. First of all, he says, if you need proof that I'm divine, in other words, the Father is in me and I'm the Father, that's divinity, just examine my works. Forget what I've talked about, just look at what I've done. And uh, that I declare my divinity is another proof that the Father is in me. I would not say this if this was not the case. Because if, I, if the Father was not in me, if there was not divinity in me, for me to say that would be sinful. It would be blasphemous. And in addition to these, Jesus adds other proofs of His divine identity. The apostles themselves will do miracles in His name. As a matter of fact, they already have. You know, so the, the question that is begged to be asked here is, where do you think you got the power to do what you do? I gave you that power. You didn't get that power on your, on your own. And also, He will answer their prayers. That's in the future. So he finishes by imposing a condition that only God can impose, and he did it in the past, that their faith and love and devotion be measured by obedience. The witness of true Christianity towards others is love. The witness of true Christianity before God is obedience. All right, dialogue number four, we need to kind of move here. Dialogue number four is with Judas, not Judas Iscariot, but Judas who was also called Thaddeus. He did have a name change for obvious reasons. So we go to chapter 14, verse 16, says, Jesus continues, says, I will ask the Father and He will give you another helper that He may be with you forever. That is the, Holy, uh, that is the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it does not see Him or know Him but you know him because he abides with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans, I will come to you. After a little while, the world will no longer see me, but you will see me because I live. You will live also. In that day, you will know that I am in my Father and you in me and I in you. One more verse. He who has my commandments and keeps them is the one who loves me and he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and will disclose myself to him. So Jesus builds you know, another idea <clears throat> upon the one he had just given in response to Philip. Philip wanted to have a clear vision, an experience of the Father, something that would stay with them into the troubled future Jesus was speaking of. In other words, Philip is saying, look, if you're going to go away, leave us something that we can hang on to some sort of proof, some sort of, you know. So Jesus promises that even if He leaves them, they will not be alone. They will not be without the spiritual comfort that they have experienced with His presence among them. Now, of course, He's still referring to His association with the Father. 
Jesus promises to ask the Father to send the Spirit not only to be among them, but to be within them, not only for a little while, but forever. He's been with them through Christ. Okay, the Holy Spirit has been with the apostles through Christ. But now, when Christ leaves, the Spirit will be with them uniquely. You know, I, I want to make a kind of a, a side comment here. You know, we, we read the book of Acts, chapter two, uh, verse 37, 38, as a proof text, you know, that it's necessary to be baptized. And of course it is, you know, that's basic Christianity. We, 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 we become Christians by repenting and being baptized. But at the time when Peter was preaching that sermon, the part that really resonated with the people was not necessarily the idea of baptism because they were used to that. John the Baptist had been preaching that years before and Jesus and his apostles had been preaching baptism you know, for, for years. No, the thing that was new that, was, that really resonated with them was the idea that they would receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. That was the thing that was like new. Not that their sins would be forgiven, it was necessary, but that wasn't new. You see, in the Old Testament, the Spirit would come upon a prophet or a king or a judge or a special servant of God for a period of time. Like Isaiah would say, the Spirit was upon me, you know, and then he'd prophesy. That's how the Spirit was interacting with individual uh, people. The promise of the prophets for the New Testament, when the Messiah would eventually come, was that when the Messiah came, everybody would have the Spirit, not just the kings, not just the prophets, not just the special people, everybody, young and old, male and female, slave, free, everybody would have the Spirit of God within them. And so when Peter gets up to preach and says, repent and be baptized, they've heard that a lot. And, and as they should, that, that was the message. But then when he added, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, bing! That's when all those prophecies, you know, it was like, the, if, if you were standing there, you'd say, oh, now's that time. Now's the time for this thing to happen, that all of us receive the Spirit of God. Okay, so little aside there, uh, why it's very important where Jesus is saying to them, you know, the Spirit, I'm, I'm going to send the Spirit. Very important. He's just piggybacking onto the prophecies that were made about that in the Old Testament. And so he points them to the future, and once again he speaks of his death, but now he adds the idea of his resurrection and tells them that the sign of his resurrection will guarantee their own. In other words, if I can resurrect from the dead, then you can resurrect from the dead. And so this final miracle, resurrection, will be the proof that Philip needs to believe in the divinity of Jesus. Remember now the question, Philip is saying, give us something. Give us something to hang on to, you know? And so Jesus, in this passage, He gives them something. He says, the proof will also confirm all He has said to them, even the prophecy concerning the sending of the Spirit and their own resurrection. So the resurrection of Jesus is the key proof that confirms everything that Jesus has said in the past. So in the end, He repeats again that Christian love is expressed in obedience to Christ's word, and those who do will be rewarded by the experience that Philip searched for, but he couldn't find. And that is, the experience is God's manifestation. God's manif excuse me, God manifests Himself to the believer. How? Through the Holy Spirit, through the word of God, and through the loving lives of believers. All these elements were made possible through Jesus Christ. All right, let's keep going in the passage, verse 22. Judas here, because remember we said the fourth dialogue. So Judas, not Iscariot, said to him, Lord, what then has happened that you are going to disclose yourself to us and not to the world? And so Jesus has found his attention and promises, excuse me, he has focused his attention and promises on the apostles themselves. He said, this is going to happen to you, I'm coming here to you, you will know the Father, you're going to go to heaven, you, know, so, you, 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 you. So Judas, not the traitor, brings up another point. He says, in essence, if our task is to convert others, how come you're only revealing yourself to us? Why not to the Jews? 
you know, Thaddeus wonders if there's been a change in plan here. And so watch Jesus' response. Jesus answered and said to him, if anyone loves me, he'll keep my word and my Father will love him and we will come to him and make our abode with him. He who does not love me does not keep my words and the word which you hear is not mine, but the Father's who sent me. So Jesus answers him that the revelation of the Father for anyone is based on the acceptance of the Son. In other words, it's for you. Why? Because you believe in me. And that'll be the condition in the future. If a person accepts the Son by loving Him through obedience to His word, then both the Father and the Son will reveal themselves to that person. There's no change in the plan. It's a clarification of how these spiritual things work. It's instruction from God Himself. In other words, you have what you have because you believe in me. Well, that's the same basis for everybody else. The Lord assures not only Judas, but the other apostles that which, uh, excuse me, that that which they desire, what do they desire? Assurance, comfort from God. It's within reach. It's standing right in front of them in the form of a person. All right, so Jesus has answered their questions and He's going to summarize His response to them about these matters in the last couple of verses. So let's read that. So uh, He summarizes His response about these things. First of all, He reviews His promise of the Holy Spirit. Clarification. He says, these things, meaning that I've just spoken to you, these things I have spoken to you while abiding with you, but the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, He will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I said uh, to you. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you, not as the world gives do I give to you. Do not let your heart be troubled, nor let it be fearful. And so they've asked questions and He's answered them, but they still have more questions. Their knowledge you know, is not complete yet on this subject. So the Lord promises the Holy Spirit once again, but this time He emphasizes the fact that the Holy Spirit will not only comfort them, but He'll also speak the truth to them. He will enable them to both remember and understand all the teachings of Christ, and this will be comforting indeed. Again, look at the human side of it. You've been following this Messiah for three years. He has taught you and taught you and taught you. You've got this stuff, you're like, you're like, a, you know, you're like a pitcher of water that's just, there's so much stuff. And now he's telling you, you're going to go out and teach other people. How would you feel about that? <laughs> I'd feel a little nervous. <laughs> Did I get everything? How can I teach other people? I'm barely understanding myself. I don't, you know, I don't, even, rem I, I don't even remember the sermon title from two weeks ago, let alone everything that you've taught in three years. So he comforts them. He says, don't worry. Not only will the Spirit comfort you, in other words, give you that comfort you need, this, the assurance you need, because I'm gone, He'll come and He'll give you the same kind of assurance that I gave you. He'll also bring to your memory everything I taught you. And He'll also give you understanding of everything I taught you. Don't, don't worry about that. So this is the way His peace will be imparted to them. You know, the world tries for peace with treaties or threats or UN or whatever. Jesus gives them a knowledge and understanding of the truth. That brings peace. He says, you're, you're going to remember the truth and you're going to understand the truth about all the things that I taught you. So rest easy, rest easy. So when they will put together the teachings and the promises of Christ with the resurrection, they will then have peace concerning their lives here and their hope for eternal life. No need for fear or anxiety. They'll know what's going on. Number two, he reminds them of his prophecy, verse 28. So he says, uh, you've heard that I said to you, I go away and I will come to you. If you loved me, you would have rejoiced because I go to the Father, for the Father is greater than I. Jesus answered and said to him, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word and my Father will love him and we will come to him and make our abode with him. He who does not love me does not keep my words and the word which you hear is not mine but the Father's who sent me. And then verse 31, 
but so that the word, uh, world may know that I love the Father, I do exactly as the Father commanded me, get up and let us go from here. So Jesus assesses the situation as it ought to be, not as it is. In other words, if they really loved Him, they would be happy that He is leaving this earthly body to be with the Father. After all, once He is with the Father, not only is His suffering over, He can send the Holy Spirit. So He's saying to them, if you understood this, if you got this, then you'd be happy. We wouldn't be sad here, you'd be happy. We're near the end, you know, the good is coming. But they don't get it. You know, they're still a little thick, they don't get it. And so when Jesus refers to the Father as greater than Himself, He means Himself as a man, especially one condemned to die. And so He repeats His prophecy of the coming events so that they'll remember clearly that He called it in advance of the actual events. So He wants them to know, before I died, I told you I was going to die and I was going to resurrect. I told you that in advance. So that when it happens, I mean, it'll be a lock. You will understand, everything will be clear. And yet, for us, for our study, this is yet another call on them to believe, but one that points to the future. In other words, when you see all the things that I predicted would happen actually happen, then let this be another reason for you to believe. He claims that his own end is near and Satan will do his work to destroy him, but he wants them to know that he will accept the torture and death. Why? because the Father commanded him to do this and he will obey to demonstrate his love. Remember what I said? How do you show you know, your distinction? By loving one another. How do you show your faith? By obeying. And so the cross, he does two things at once. He shows his love for his brethren. How? He offers his life. And then how does he show his honor to God? He obeys unto death. The cross is that perfect intersection between faith and love and obedience, right there. And so he finishes with the command to rise from the table. They don't leave the room yet. There's still another section. While they're still in the room, he's going to continue to teach them and encourage them concerning the things that are about to happen. We're going to stop right here. We're going to pick this up in our next lesson.